Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Zoom meeting, uh, the previous one meeting. And we are excited to have that team ready for this meeting. So, when you are ready, then I have that team ready to go ahead. All right, salam alaikum, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well and that you're preparing well for your interviews. Um, today, our team is going to be presenting. Uh, our first presenter is going to be Dr. Sara Tarafi, and it's um, going to be on elder abuse. Um, Sara, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Um, hello, Dr. Nadir and dear fellows. Um, today, we're going to discuss elder abuse. Um, let me see um, if I could share my screen. Perfect. Can anyone see my screen? We can see your screen, yeah. It's okay, perfect. perfect. So um, today we're going to be discussing elder abuse, which is a very important public health problem. The slides I will be using today are not mine. They're a courtesy of uh, Dr. Chris Burt, which is um, a family practitioner from the Philippines. Um, I would be using his slides today. So today we're going to learn about the forms of elder abuse, how to identify the risk factors with elder abuse, and, and also to know what are the barriers that uh, prevent us from identifying it in the first place. We're also going to learn about how to assess a person we suspect that is a, um, a victim of abuse. And we're going to learn about who are the individuals more likely to be victims, how to manage them. And we're going to conclude by discussing ways to help prevent it in the first place. So there was a study conducted in uh, 1996 uh, by the U.S. Administration on Aging called the National Elder Abuse Incidents. It found that approximately 450,000 over 60 year old elderly people in the community were subject to some form of abuse. 80% of those went unreported. And the WHO last year reported that one in six people over the age of 60 experienced some kind of abuse just in the last year itself in the community. And these numbers are even higher when we go into like institutions such as nursing homes and long-term facilities, especially with COVID, it just spiked way up as well. So what are the, what is abuse? What is considered abuse? Uh, there are so many forms of abuse. We're going to be discussing a couple of them here. So we're going to start about uh, with physical abuse. Physical abuse is that it is what it is just like causing bodily harm, either like by striking the elderly, uh, the adult, um, older adult, pushing them, slapping them. It could be also like in the form of using restraints on them, either physical restraints or chemical restraints, just medicating them. Um, it could be confining them to a specific, let's say, room or space. There's also sexual abuse. There's psychological abuse, or it's also called um, emotional abuse. So it's like um, saying hurtful words, yelling, threatening, ignoring the older adult. Um, it could be withholding from their medications, nutrition or hydration, um, threatening to institutionalize them or keeping them from seeing just like their friends or loved ones or other family members. There's also financial abuse. Uh, financial abuse has many forms. It could be either like forging their checks, taking their benefits or um, retirement money, using their credit cards without them knowing, um, changing their will and just to benefit the caregiver or the someone who is um, conducting this abuse. It could be also like changing their life insurance policies or their house, um, their house title. Um, it could be neglecting to pay their rent 
or mortgage like uh, here in the US. So um, not paying their mortgages or their medical ex um, expenses or their bills. There's also neglect. Now neglect, um, it has two forms, can come into two forms. It's all together, it's just failure to provide um, the necessary services for maintaining the health of that older adult. It could be intentional that the caregiver fails to provide that care, either um, refusing to help with their hygiene assistance, medications, food, um, physical assistance when needed, or it could be unintentional, which is just the result of the caregiver's ignorance or inability to provide the basic needs for that older adult. There's also a form of self-neglect, which is um, the person themselves, the older adult themselves, neglects to um, in, do the things that they need to do, like their self-care. Um, it could be either due to they have conflicting views about it, or um, it could be due to their mental status. So this is a bit of a hard area to uh, to know, and because we also try to um, just um, like hold the, sorry, just like respect the uh, older adults' uh, autonomy. So that could be a bit of an area hard to detect. So what are the risk factors that make that person a victim? Well, most victims of abuse are women, although some are men, and they're usually over the age of 75 with poor health, low income, they're isolated, they could be suffering from alcohol abuse, they could have history of mental illness or domestic violence, um, they could be, um, they have they could have no family or friends nearby living with them, or they could have memory problems, for example, and or dementia. There are certain like warning signs that could um, of the caregiver themselves that could indicate that this person could be um, abusing the older adult. It could be either that caregiver is financially dependent on the victim. There's history of any kind of substance abuse, or they have a record of history of prior violent events. And it could also be just caregiver burnout. They're just tired. They don't have that support that they need, and they neglect the, the needs of that older adult, or they lash out on them. So how can we identify um, these? Um, sorry, before, before knowing that, um, we're going to just learn about the barriers to identifying elder abuse. We're more cognizant or more aware of child abuse that uh, more than elder abuse. So there are patient-related factors and physician-related factors. Um, for example, patient-related factors is that the person is socially isolated. He has no contact, we're, no, we're not able to know about those. There's fear of retribution. They could fear that if what if that uh, if they say anything, then the caregiver would know, and then things would just get worse. Or that person could have cognitive impairments. For the for us for our part, we underestimate the prevalence of elder abuse. Um, sometimes we don't know how to assess for it we don't have systematic plan put in place to identify when uh, to identify it and what to do after we identify elder abuse so how can we assess it in the first place if we do suspect that that person is suffering from elder abuse we have to take a careful history first of all we could take a history with the patient and the caregiver together in the same place so as just to see their dynamics together and then the patient must be interviewed privately. We should ask about their current health status, their living arrangements, financial status, any emotional stressors, and their social support. Um, if a person, then they're like physically, we're doing their physical exam, we have to do a proper physical exam, notice any bruising or burns, um, assess their cognitive function, see if there are any inner, uh, injuries um, secondary to fall to fall or 
um, it could we could see sometimes like restrained restraining um, marks on that individual, any findings of sexual abuse or any injuries that could not be explained by that by the elder. Also, they're, if they're losing weight, they're having trouble sleeping, they're not doing the activities that they used to enjoy before, um, they look uncapped, unwashed, with dirty clothes. All of those could be indications that something is going on and we need to look deeper into this. When we suspected, then after taking the history and doing physical examination, we have to document everything. We write a note, take any um, document where the injuries we found on that individual, if any were found, take photographs, do x-rays, do the initial labs, the main labs that we need to do that could assess, for example, like malnutrition or dehydration. Um, after doing all of that, we reach out to that elder if they're um, cognitively, um, they could understand us well. We need to tell them that we do suspect something is going on and we are here to help. Um, we also need to inform the elders um, social services to come into the picture with us in, in this to assist in the evaluation and they will be able to investigate the issue more deeper. Also, one of the important things that we can do is to contact the family physician if they have a family physicians, because family physicians, they have long-term relationship with the patient and their families, so they are more able to assess any risk factors. So um, we can also insist other home health care professionals or other home-based service providers, which can go into their homes and observe the home environment and how the caregiver and the elder um, are. And of course, community services, there are so many resources in the community that we can enlist to help us deal with elder abuse situations. So um, to conclude it, elder abuse will not stop it its own. We have, if we find it, we have to reach out and we have to help. We have to provide proper care of elderly individuals when they come to us. And we and especially if we can contact their family physicians, that's the best thing to do. We have to just have a higher, more like um, awareness of understanding like the warning signs and looking for them and detecting them faster. Uh, we need to work with um our patients, well, we have to get that deep patient, doctor-patient relationship in place, which will just make things so much easier and they would be able to open, open to us more easily and just find support in the community as well. Thank you so much. That's um, my presentation for today. Any questions? If no questions, I, I'll leave it to Dr. Selma to go with the other presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sara. Yeah. Um, that was um, great. Um, moving on, we are going to discuss um, how to prevent Alzheimer's um, and what the current tools we have in the literature. Um, and that's going to be presented by Dr. Shaht and Dr. Al-Muntasir, whenever you guys are ready. Okay, hello everybody. I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to present the first six slides of the Alzheimer's disease prevention and my colleague will carry on for the next six. Okay. Alzheimer's disease prevention. So we'll start my presentation by assessing the assessing the risks. 
Uh, before we could talk about the prevention of the Alzheimer's disease, we need to understand there are modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors for the Alzheimer's disease. The modifiable risk factors include traumatic brain injury, hypertension, hearing loss, obesity in midlife, also low physical activity, social isolation, and diabetes models. And then the genetic risk factors are, can be divided into two, which one causes early onset and the second one causes late onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, is related to Brazilian gene located on chromosome 1 and 14, which uh, play a role in the regulation of the conversion of the beta amyloid protein from the beta amyloid precursor, and the accumulation of the beta amyloid causes the Alzheimer's disease. Also, the next gene is called uh, uh, located on chromosome 19, which uh, codes for the apple protein, apple lipoprotein E, which uh, when it comes in high levels, it causes the beta amyloid accumulation. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll talk first about the modifiable risk factors. They can be divided into early risk factors, early life risk factors, uh, midlife risk factors, and late life risk factors. The early life risk factors are uh, was found to be that low education. So. Uh, it amplifies the risk by 1.6, and it's and some theory says that secondary school education, uh, uh, secondary school education is theory believed to be related to limited cognitive reserve. However, uh, high school, however, post high school uh, is found to be protective uh, and it increases the cognitive reserve, but the, but there is limited data on that. And the midlife risk factors include hearing loss. Uh, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, and obesity. So hearing loss uh, is related to Alzheimer's disease, but the etiology is unclear, but it's so, uh, some thought that it could be due to decreased cognitive stimulation and increased atrophy in the temporal lobe. And studies have found that 30% that of adults uh, more than 55 years have hearing aid. So that's a big uh, percentage. And also they found that, that hearing aid uh, mediated uh, and causes decline of the risk factor. Also, the traumatic brain injury cause increases the risk factors by 1.4, and it's found out that severe rep repetitive injury increases the risk and worsen, uh, and worsen the other disease by the deposition of the apple lipoprotein E. Also, it causes the deposition of the abnormal phosphorylated tau protein in the hippocampus, which leads to formation of the neurofibrillary tangles that's related to the, the Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology. And the next risk factor is hypertension. Uh, hypertension is related to vascular disease and it causes increased risk factors for stroke, which contribute to vascular dementia. And it's what was found that systolic blood pressure greater than 114 carries a high risk. So good blood, good blood pressure controls can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Also, obesity was found that it amplifies the risk by 1.6 and also the diabetes causes uh, increases the risk of dementia by causing inflammation and also lack of insulin release is thought to be affecting the uh, affect the clearance of amyloid protein. The late life risk factors include smoking, smoking, depression, and physical inactivity and social isolation. So smoking is also related to cardiovascular risk, which is also related to the brain health. And, and cigarettes contain uh, neurotoxins that can harm the CNS. And also, and, and so it increases, the risk for, it increases the risk for vascular dementia. And depression, it found out that it amplifies the risk by 1.9. Studies are unsure of the mechanism, but it's found that it's built linked to dementia by the effect of stress hormone and it can affect the neuronal growth and it can affect the volume of the hippocampus. And physical inactivity was found that it amplifies the risk by 1.4 and data shows that high physical activity decreases the risk of Alzheimer's disease by high. And also exercise improves the mood and the balance and the overall, and the overall risk. Social isolation. Social isolation causes less cognitive activity and it's also linked to depression, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease, which every one of them on their own carries a risk factor for all the heart disease. And also there are additional risk factors that can be linked to uh, all the harm disease. One of them is vision vision impairment. With the, the, the exact etiology is not clear, but it, it could be related to the decreased uh, 
could be related to the decreased cognitive stimulation and also high cholesterol level, which is associated with high level of A, beta lipoprotein E, which, which causes its accumulation in the brain and causes the Alzheimer's disease. Also sleep apnea was, sleep apnea, some studies have shown that it's related to Alzheimer's disease, but due to impaired clearance of the beta amyloid from the CSF. And also postmenopausal women, the reduction of hormone is linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And finally, the high level of homocysteine. <laughs> so high level of homocysteine, it causes NMDA receptor dysfunction, which affects the function of the brain and also which quite can lead to neuronal apoptosis and loss of the domain at the dopaminergic ne neurons. And also it causes apparent DNA methylation and mitochondrial dysfunction. And also high level of homocysteine favors the oxidative stress which can lead to free radicals and non-radical oxidants that can lead to injury to the brain. Uh, so the first is, the first step in, in assessment is by doing some online risk factor calculated. So the most commonly used was developed by the Australian National University of College of, of Health and Science Medicine. It's called Alzheimer's Disease Risk Index, and it comes in the form of questionnaire. It reviews the major risk factors and it can provide a good uh, risk profile on the patient. It usually takes about 10 to 20, 10 to 15 minutes to complete, and it carries 11 major risk factors and four protective factors. And also there are some risk calculators that were found in the literature, some called uh, Medi India and the Project of Life. Uh, these are also uh, risk, uh, online risk calculators that can be used. So risk um, mutation, so Dr. So I have to carry on the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Al-Mutasir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Shahda Rashid, Shahda al uh, I'll continue the presentation. Uh, just give me a minute to share my screen. Okay, just one second. Did I did I share? Okay. Uh do you see my my screen now? Uh yes, it's clear. Thank you. So I'll talk about the risk mitigation. Uh, we have main point we need to fix it first. Uh, the goal is to prevent Alzheimer's disease from occurring and slowing down of clinical uh, progression if happened. Uh, the third point that no pills or tonics are uh, scientifically proven to improve uh, neurocognitive function. Uh, we have acetal. Uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like uh, memantine are not indicated for uh, early stage uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Also being found to be uh, ineffective in mild cognitive impairment. Uh, prevention methods uh, include uh, adopting brain healthy lifestyle is the main point that we will uh, talk about in the next slide. Okay, so the brain health lifestyle, we could make this with uh, some positive habits. Uh, the first one is physical exercise, which improves uh, cerebral blood flow, decreased loss of cortical tissue, and increased release of uh, neural growth factors, thereby, thereby uh, improving synaptogenesis and neuroplasticity. The second point is brain healthy diet. And this could be with the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet and uh, Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay, uh, MIND. 
Uh, also, we have brain stimulation and soothing. And uh, this, we can make this with reading, writing, games, and social activities, uh, maintaining good mood, uh, also volunteer work, and uh, a sense of uh, self purpose. Definitely adequate sleep and hydration, uh, very important for the general health and brain health. Uh, or, yes, and also the good oral hygiene, uh, some natural experiences or yoga. Uh, the, general, the general health, like we need physical health maintenance by controlling blood pressure, uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, cholesterol, and infections. Uh, we can say that any two or three uh, of the following five factors will reduce the risk by about 37%, which is the physical exercise, MIND, the diet, cognitive exercises, uh, stopping the sm no smoking, and limiting uh, alcohol intake. When we speak about the prevention of the disease, we need to mention something about the uh, drug regimens used for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, currently, the management of patients with Alzheimer's disease involves drugs that provide symptomatic therapy. Research uh, approaches for future therapies are focusing on disease modifying and or preventive. Sorry. Okay, sorry. So we have current FDA approved regimens are described here. First, we have the cholinesterase uh, inhibitors, which we use it for mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease only. Uh, the mode of action is not fully understood, but believed to prevent breakdown, breakdown of uh, acetylcholine, which is essential for memory and thinking. Uh, NMDA inhibitors, uh, we use this for severe or advanced Alzheimer's disease only. Uh, n methyl d aspartate antagonist uh, uh, has the effect that uh, believed to decrease symptoms and allow daily function maintenance. Uh, the disease motiv modifying or uh, immunotherapy, these medications target underlying cause only one FDA approved one uh, in the market and is an uh, MCA. This, uh, this targets uh, B amyloid in the central nervous system and helps reduce plaques. This medication requires extensive imaging pre and post treatment. Other MCA currently in phase three trial testing. Also, they use this for mild cognitive impairment and early stage Alzheimer's disease. Now, we will mention some of these medications by name and uh, dosing and side effects. From the cholinesterase inhibitors, we mentioned the donipzil, which used, uh, used for mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, the side effects of this medication is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Sometimes it can cause muscle cramping and weight loss, and it comes in different doses. Uh, Revestigmines uh, also for mild, moderate to severe. Uh, uh, the side effects that the same as the, the donipzil and uh, it found in oral, you can use the twice a day or once a day. Um, the donipzil and memantine combination, uh, this used for moderate to severe and uh, it can block uh, excess uh, glutamates and the side effects are headaches and dizziness. Uh, we have the glutamine, which stimulates nicotinic receptors to release more acetylcholine. Uh, the side effects are the same and uh, has different doses. And uh, we can start it with the small dose and then later we can increase the dose. Then we can reach the maintenance for 24 milligram only. Uh, other combination is memantine donabazil, uh, seven milligram, 10 milligram. Uh, also we have memantine alone, five milligram OD. 
and we can, this is the maintenance. And then we have 10 milligram per day QD. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies, like uh, aducanumab, this given as infusion every four weeks, uh, the dose titrated to full dose, uh, it's expensive and requires uh, PET and MRI scans before and after the treatment to confirm presence of uh, beta amyloid, uh, which is done prior to the first, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, and the twelfth. Uh, the dose is uh, calculated like 10 milligram per kg for weekly over one hour. Uh, from the lambda inhibitors, we have the memantine. Uh, tabs, five milligram OD initially and increased to 10 milligram as maintenance. Okay, there is also oral solution. When we speak about the medication, we have to speak about the list of medications that can have some interactions and uh, side effects uh, with the elder population. We have the sleep aids that can increase confusion and risk of fall. We have also the anti-anxiety that sorry that can cause somnolence, dizziness, uh, increase the risk of fall and confusion. Also, the anticonvulsants uh, can cause somnolence, dizziness, uh, mood swings, and confusion. The antipsychotics increase risk of death in those with dementia. So these medication, we need to avoid it with patients uh, with early Alzheimer or even the general geriatric population. In the summary, we will say that a major breakthrough in risk reduction is within reach and the science is evolving rapidly. As an example, there is growing evidence that people can lower their risk of dementia by adopting healthy lifestyle habits like regular exercise and blood pressure control. A growing body of evidence indicates that healthy behaviors are also associated with a reduced risk of cognitive decline, including physical diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And that's the end of our presentation today. Thank you for listening. And if you have any question. Sorry. If no question, I'll give the mic to Dr. Selma. And thank you everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Shaht and Al Muntasar. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, moving on, we are going to talk about HCOP NIS, and that's going to be uh, presented by Dr. Josefa and myself. Thank you. Josefa, if you're ready. Hi, everyone. I am Zayfa. Uh, today, me and uh, Dr. Selma will uh, talk about the HCOP databases. Just let me share my screen. Dr. Selma, you have the PowerPoint, the slide? I do. Um, do you want me to play it for you? Uh, yes, please. Okay, yeah, yeah sure.
just a second, it's not, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, can okay. you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So the H cup stands for the healthcare, uh, the healthcare cost and utilization project, uh, which is a family of healthcare databases and related software tools. Uh, it's developed through uh, federal and state and private industry partnerships and sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality itself is functioning under the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, next. 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 Uh, so the h -Cup is a comprehensive uh, set of publicly available all-payer healthcare data, uh, including self-pay and those held as no charge, includes multi-year inpatient and outpatient data based on hospital billing records. And it has four, uh, four components, the h -Cup database itself, which we'll talk about later in this presentation, online tools for research, analytics and user support. Next. So the data used in each cup is caring for the cost of care and readmission, geographic uh, variation, trends over time, COVID-19 related analysis. Next. Uh, natural disasters, access to care, quality of care and opioid related analysis. Uh, as you can see, uh, almost all the, all the states uh, are participating uh, in the h -Cup database. Next. Uh, this map, uh, representing the partners providing inpatient data. And as you can see, there is only two, uh, two states that are not participating. I think it's Idaho and Alabama. Next. And this map, uh, you can see the partners providing ambulatory stability and service data, which is a part of uh, the h -Cup database. Here we can see the providing images uh, data. Next. Uh, here, the h -Cup participation by data type. Next. So the foundation of h -Cup, uh, cup data are demographic data, like the name, age of birth, origin, address. The second type is diagnosis and procedures and charges. Next. Uh, next, how the databases are generated by patient entering the hospital, then the billing record, uh, record created, then the hospital sends billing data and uh, additional data elements to data organization, then the states store data in varying form formats, then the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality standardized data to create uniform h -Cup databases for all states. Next. Uh, state data are mapped to standardized h -Cup format, which allows for consistent data elements and values for comparison across the state. Then the quality checks are performed. Then additional data elements are available, like value added variations are variables, like supplemental variables for revisit analysis, injury indicators, indicators for observation and emergency department services, uh, the hospital characteristic itself, like its teaching status and bed size, 
then the diagnosis related to and severity measures. Next. So the hospitals included in the HCAP databases are mostly the community hospitals, which constitute 85% of uh, the healthcare system in the United States. Uh, as we can see here in the table, uh, the included hospital includes the uh, multi specialty general hospital, Opsangaini Center, ENT Hospital, Orthopedic Hospital, Pediatric Hospital, and Public and Academic Medical Center. The hospitals that are excluded from the HCAP databases, which only constitute 15% of the healthcare system of the United States, are the nine federal long term care hospitals. Psychiatric hospital, alcoholism, and chemical dependence center, long term care rehabilitation, Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs, Indian Health Services System, and COVID infirmaries and prison hospitals. Next. Uh, 85% of U.S. hospitals are community hospitals, 15% are non-community hospitals, like the non-federal psychiatric, non-federal uh, college infirmary, ETC. Next. So there is community hospitals provide a range of services, like HCAP generally does not receive data from non-community hospitals, such as psychiatric facilities, but however, Patients are treated for mental health condition in a community hospital. Their information is included in HCAP database. Uh, next. I think uh, here you, uh, you can go from here, Dr. Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hazefa. Um, so basically, to summarize um, what he said, what is HCUP and why is it important to us um, in the medical field? Um, it just basically gives you access to the largest con collection of um, like longitudinal hospital care data in the U.S. Um, and so, you know, it provides like reliable, comprehensive information that can use can be used by healthcare providers, researchers. Um, insurance companies, anyone that wants to know and has questions about healthcare and how it's been used, you know, how it was accessed, what were the outcomes, what did it cost, you know, and because it's such a large project, it's, um, it had to be like federally regulated by a body, which is the, um, what Dr. Josefa mentioned, the AHRQ or the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And um, so that's the overseeing body. And the body that collects all of this data from hospitals statewide is the HCUP. Um, and so it's divided into hospital inpatient stays, ambulatory services, ER services, and so on and so forth. Um, this is done through the database and related software tools. Um, so as mentioned previously, these are the different hospital settings. We've got inpatient databases. Um, it tells you about your discharges, your admissions, readmissions, everything. And then the outpatient databases. So outpatient surgeries, emer emergency department visits, so on and so forth. Um, it does have a geographic like variation from one state to the other. It could be state by state level. It could be nationwide. But currently, um, out of the 50 states, we have 49 partners, um, which is 48 states and um, District of Columbia. They provide um, full statewide inpatient data. So not all states provide everything. 48, 48, um, 49 sorry, partners provide um, inpatient data. 36 provide outpatient surgery and services data, and then 42 partners provide emergency um, department data. Um, 
Um, HCOP databases exclude um, physician office, like out, outpatient clinics, um, pharmacy, lab and radiology information. So the state in inpatient databases, it's called SID. And as we mentioned, you know, it includes your patient inpatient discharge, you know, um, all the admissions and so on and so forth. We've got the state ambulatory surgery and services databases, um, which refers to outpatient um, surgery. Um, and then the state emergency department databases. Um, and so you, so you have all of this information that's being collected from the different major departments of um, hospitals. Continued. Um, We've got the NIS, which is the National Inpatient Sample. They generate national and regional estimates of inpatient utilization, access, quality, patient safety, and so on and so forth. Um, as we mentioned earl earlier, there's also a kids inpatient database, and it does the same thing, but for the pediatric um, population. We've got the NASS, or the Nationwide Ambulatory Surg Surgery Sample which provides data within that uh, field or section. Um, the emergency department sample is called NEDS or NEDS. And then we've got the nationwide readmissions database or NRD, which generates um, national estimates of all cause and condition specific readmissions. Um, so as you can see, it's a very large um, database with access to so many variables, so much information, um, which can be extremely beneficial um, to healthcare providers and um, researchers. Um, we have already mentioned this, I'm gonna move on. So what are the benefits and limitations of these databases? Benefits are, is you have access to a huge and large number of records. Um, we're gonna speak about coding in a little bit, but there is, a generalized protocol or guideline for our uniform coding system that helps it, you know, be familiar and readily readable. Um, there's routine and re um, regular collection, ease of access, you know, all sorts of pairs, self-pay, insurance, all are included. Um, it's available at a local, state, regional, and national level. And then um, there's also supplemental uh, variables available to facilitate re research. Um, so what are the limitations? Um, you, you do not have access to um, reimbursed claims information. Um, you don't have um, limited clinical details. So you might not actually know what the intricacies of a certain admission was or a certain mortality was. You'll just get numbers. Um, it doesn't include the VA, um, and then um, doesn't show the complete episode of care. They lack um, hospital char characteristic information, making it you know harder to identify which hospital you're referring to. And then you cannot link nationwide databases to external sources. Um, sometimes there are differences in coding across hospitals, but it's usually very minor um, differences, not a, a remarkable difference where um, it will be completely um, unfamiliar to a different state or hospital. Um, so what data elements are available in the HCOP databases? Uh, Dr. Josefa earlier mentioned uh, demographics. So you'll find stuff about the patient's age, sex, you know, do they come from an herbal or a rural location? You'll find um, what procedures and diagnosis um, are in there using ICD-10 or 9 coding. Um, you'll find discharge information, you know, like payment source, whether it's self-pay or insurance, um, and then discharge status. Um, you also have access to resources such as length of stay, what the total charges were, and then hospital characteristics are only in HCUP nationwide databases. Um, we already mentioned this, it differs from one state to the other. Not all states um, are uniformly um, accessible in all um, the, like the variable um, 
sectors. So some are, it varies from race and ethnicity, the county, um, zip code, um, and a few other things that you can see on the screen. Um, these are all the states um, that we mentioned earlier. Not all of them participate for all years and all databases. Some provide only some recognition and ignore others and so on and so forth. Um, so what is the HCAP publication search? Um, there is um, a domain where you can actually look for publications just like you would on PubMed and you know all the other um, platforms to search for peer-reviewed um, articles. Um, it says approximately 10,000 peer-reviewed publications using HCAP data um, products or tools are present. Um, I'll link, I'll put the link in the chat box um, at the very end, but this is kind of what you're looking at. Um, you can just filter it um, and basically um, search what you'd like. What pre-calculated statistics are available? Um, it's a free online query system. Users generate tables and figures of outcomes by diagnosis and procedure classifications. Um, it can be cross-classified by patient and hospital characteristics and users can produce county level um, statistical maps. So it's very important to know how HCUP um, utilizes the, the data from hospitals and what software tools it uses. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but um, every procedure or diagnosis that's made inpatient, outpatient, whatever, um, there's a coding system for it. And it's based on the setting of the care, if it's inpatient, outpatient. And then it also applies to whether it's um, a diagnosis code or a procedure code. Um, so for example, a diagnosis, um, it could be, we, we currently use ICD-10, most of all, I'll come into the next slide for that. But let's say, for example, a patient presented with abdominal pain. And so you're going to use, for example, um, ICD-10 code of R10.9, and that kind of helps, you know, for insurance purposes, payment purposes, diagnosis purposes, and so on and so forth. If it's a procedure-related um, um, sort of care or setting, um, you also use um, ICD-10 PICS or HIC level 1 or HIC level 2. Um, ICD-9, not used as much. So what's, what is ICD? Um, it's the International Classification of Disease. There is a ninth revision and a 10th revision. Um, it's widely used across the U.S. Um, you find it, at, you know, as you're working in hospitals, it's how you bill, um, and it's, it's very important. It's a very important part of um, our work as healthcare providers. So this is another example um, of ICD-10 coding. Um, for example, a patient has come in with chest pain, we've done all our necessary stuff, and we've diagnosed them with acute MI. So these are the ICD-10 codes that are available. Each one would depend on a couple of factors. Um, like let's say a, G a gastrointestinal ulcer, these are the codes. Um, a good example would be like, um, I'm going to use musculoskeletal um, example. So let's say um, we have uh, knee pain. Someone's presented with knee pain. We have a, a series of ICD-10 codes. Is it right knee pain? Is it bilateral? And that's how the different codes come in. Um, so when I put, for example, um, M10 point blah, 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 then I know, for example, it's right knee pain, possibly caused to trauma. So th they're just various sections. Um, as you work in hospital and you type them up, you know exactly what you're typing in. Um, so if you write right knee pain, a list comes up and you choose, oh, okay, it's this one. So right knee pain. Um, you can also classify diagnosis into one of four different types of conditions. It can be either acute chronic, both acute and chronic, or not applicable. 
and this is also part of ICD-10. Um, an example is malignancy, diabetes, you know, so all your chronic illnesses, acute, any initial encounter of injury, um, acute on chronic is kind of like um, gout or an acute asthma on chronic, an acute exacerbation with chronic asthma, um, an acute pain episode in sickle cell, you know, um, so on and so forth. And then not applicable is anything that doesn't apply to the above three. Um, this is just what we discussed, um, ICD-10, 9, and the HICPICS. <clears throat> Again, the HICPICS um, is whether you do an endoscopy or let's say, you know, give an injection. So mostly procedures, um, not given injections, like for example, endoscopy or um, let's say knee aspiration or so on and so forth. Um, so these are also more um, classifications. Um, so these are all ways to just different categories. This one goes into uh, minor diagnostic, minor therapeutic, and major diagnostic and major therapeutic. Um, minor diagnostic, for example, is like non-OR procedures that are diagnostic. An example is this code, and it stands for ultrasonography of the right heart. Um, minor therapeutic insertion of infusion device into right pulmonary artery, um, percutaneous approach, that's the code. And then if it's major, it's stuff like excision of the superior vena cava, open approach for diagnostic purposes, therapeutic, um, a cabbage, for example, open approach, um, which is therapeutic. So this just goes further into the different kinds of software tools that HCUP uses. Um, things that we have already mentioned. Um, what should you do if you have any questions about HCUP or if you want to learn more? Um, there is this website, which I'll also link, hcapus at um, um, hahrq.gov. You'll find all the detailed information on HCAP databases, tools, and products. You can access statistics, summaries, you know, tables, trends, everything. Um, you can also find tutorials, um, all the HCAP related publications and database reports. Um, and if you wanted any sort of technical assistance as well, um, there's a technical assistance team that responds to inquiries about HCUP data, products, and tools, and um, you know uses feedback um, and suggestions for improvement. Um, they also have training courses, um, and all of these that are mentioned here. So sample designs, multi-year analysis readmissions database, and um, basically anything you want to know about the HCUP. Um, this is, again, the virtual exhibit booth. Um, it has brochures, participation maps, an overview of HCUP, and any additional information that provides general project information. And that's it on my end. Let's see if we have any questions. Let me stop sharing. Okay. All righty. Any questions? Okay, moving on, um, our fourth and last, go ahead to turn another, sorry. Before we come to, uh, before we come to the last uh, section, uh, maybe we can, uh, let me just share with you uh, this one. But thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and Pastor uh, uh, so Sarah, for great presentations. These are uh, excellent, excellent. So I'll start just with the uh, application of what uh, Selma was um, referring to and uh, along with the uh, whole data. Uh, so uh, I, I'll take it back from the last uh, slide. So she was.
was talking about the ICD-10. So uh, in my notes, for, for example, I see my patient and uh, I need to write the note and at the end I put the problem list, I put the plan for what I'm doing. So let's say the patient has uh, hypokalemia. So I try to find the code for that, the ICD-10, and I put my list of diagnosis hypokalemia and this is the ICD-10. I have, as she mentioned, let's say uh, I have congestive heart failure. And it's going to be a huge uh, list of uh, diagnosis. The first one is like I-50, and then depending on what's next, it will tell me the details of that. Uh, if it's chronic, for instance, it will be uh, two to uh, chronic systolic. If it's chronic but diastolic, let's say uh, uh, here, this will be the 52 2. But if I change this to diastolic, it will be 3 2. So this is what uh, she was referring to. So as much as I would do, or the billing department would be happy with me when I put the details of my diagnosis. So if I just put heart failure, it's not gonna give uh, much of a detail, but if I want to add the historic and then it's chronic, this will add more numbers here. And then the billing department will be uh, happy when they um, send it to the medical um, insurance, they get paid faster with no issues. If I just uh, give the congestive heart failure with no any significance, it's going to be uh, I-59. Uh, so this will be just generic and specified. And the uh, insurance will not be happy with that. The reason they want to collect all this information and identify what contribute to what. Let's say they want to see patients who readmitted at the hospital. What's the reason why they come back? Patients with heart failure. We want to uh, define what group of patients with heart failure. Is it the chronic heart failure who comes to the hospital back and forth and the readmission for them high? Or is it the acute heart failure who comes back to the hospital? Is it the right side or the systolic or the diastolic? So the more we specify here, the more it will be uh, more specific when we have all this data and then they build up uh, uh, more regulations or uh, investigation or whatever they want to do. As far as the data base that uh, we were just talking about, it will help build the database so that it will be very specific. So uh, if I want to say how many patients in Michigan uh, in the last year have uh, acute systolic heart failure? So it will populate the data and will give me a specific number. So I can do my research. If I want to uh, run a query from this database, I can go using only this number. So uh, I will say I want uh, to. So it will bring all the patients with chronic systolic heart failure, something, something like that. If I want the other group, I can compare them with the chronic diastolic heart failure, if that makes sense for you guys. Uh, when we started the fellowship, uh, Sumi and her group were working on COVID. So COVID itself, they have their uh, ICD-10 code uh, for either the acute infection or uh, possibility of uh, exposure. If it's U071, this is acute infection. So uh, if the patient has symptoms and so forth. So the project she was proposing is to look at patients who are near to the hospital with COVID infection, but we want to look at what other comorbid conditions. So she was looking at, let's say, Diabetes, uh, congestive heart failure, hypertension. So, for hypertension, 
Uh, we need to look at ICD-10, uh, I-10, for example, that will get essential hypertension. So this is when we send our uh, variables to the hospital, IT team, they want us to just send the ICD code uh, numbers. They don't want us to say we want hypertension because they're going to see, oh, no, is it essential hypertension, is it the hypertensive emergency, or whatever other. So this makes uh, life easy for the IT people when they want to collect the data for us. So they will bring it because it's going to be just the code that we get them. And then they will give us how many patients with uh, hypertension, how many patients with um, diabetes also have uh, the, the COVID. So we got all the data within seconds. But if we did not use the ICD-10, when we ask for the data, there will be uh, like questions and back and forth clarifications uh, from their um, IT people. In what uh, Sama and uh, Roberta was trying to tell you is that when you collect all the data from the health network, it's, it's going to be uh, a huge database. If you want to select a certain group of patients, if you use the ICD-10, it will be faster and you can collect all the information for your study easier. But in general, uh, I think it's, it's a good uh, option if you want to do more studies. And can I share with you another um, area? If you want to look at PubMed for um, people who did studies with HCAP, you will find a lot of them, but this is the recent ones. So uh, in 2009, they were doing the statistic about HCOP, but if you scroll down, so they want to use it to for cost and utilization projects, see how they can um, use it for quality improvement, for example, the quality indicators. Um, so is it helpful or not helpful? Uh, so some, some people are using that. So uh, about 1,000 uh, papers came out just talking about the edge cup uh, not necessarily specific we can use it for certain conditions let's say we want to use uh, in the last two years compared in the two years before so we want to see how many people fell in the hospital during covid period compared to people fell in the hospital uh, in the two years before so if there is a big difference, then we can say, oh, for sure, probably uh, is the risk factor for falling in the hospital, something like that, if it makes sense for you guys. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Um, our last section of um, the session is going to be an, a mock interview. Um, but prior to that, we've got Dr. Asara. She's Dr. Asara Shafir is going to, you know, give us um, show us some slides with interview tips and advices, and then after that, we'll move on. Um, Dr. Shema and Iman, they're going to um, be our interviewer interviewee um, session for the day. Go ahead, um, Dr. Asara. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sara Shafi, and let me share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, it's clear. Um, it's just a refresher. Um, a lot of you, we've already talked about this in the previous meetings, but I'm just gonna go through them again. So tips and advice for our residency interviews. So residency programs and candidates, they share similar goals. And just like you, um, program representative want to gouge um, compatibility, get a sense of who you are and assess your strengths and weaknesses. So when you're interviewing for a residency program, the first step is to create all the things 
uh, a list of things that you want to get out of the process. So this can include uh, learning more about a specialty, um, gaining experience in a clinical setting, or connecting with other like-minded individuals. Once you've identified your primary goals, it is important uh, to think about how you can achieve them during the interview process. So for example, if you want to lear learn more about a specific specialty, it may be helpful to ask questions about the program specialty, focus, current residence, and clinical experience. Similarly, if you want to gain experience in a clinical setting, it may be helpful to ask about opportunity for shadowing or volunteering. So how can I prepare for my interview? So first, as you review and respond to invitations, try not to be anxious about the timing of your interview, whether it occurs early or late in the cycle of the interview season. Timing is not a factor in how programs rank candidates. So there's logistic preparations, so arranging travel, coordinate geography. Uh, some people are living outside of the US and um, they can get an interview. So you need to, like, if possible, decide how much time to leave yourself to explore the area to regroup after returning home and check to see if the programs offer housing or other travel assistance. And then you wanna get the details. Programs may need you to complete some paperwork before your interview. Um, they should also provide an agenda details in advance, either through ERAS or direct email. A residency program coordinator is a great point of contact at any time that you have questions. And then there's the content preparation. So you need to know the research and the program and the faculty. Um, read anything a program sends you um, about their program ahead of time. Uh, read a program's website uh, for answers to basic question. Uh, study up on faculty interest to learn where you share common interests. You need to also build a strong list of questions um, with input from residency program directors. You can learn about the residency program's trends challenges and area of focus. And then practice, practice a lot. This is very important. Ask a friend, a mentor to do a mock interview with you. At the very least, consider the different questions and question styles that you might encounter and how you'll respond. So we're gonna see some of that question later on uh, during the demonstration. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about the do's and don'ts during the residency interview. Um, so this is just a couple. Um, so everything you do during the interview can impact the impression you make on a program. So here's a few things to make sure that you do have an impact. So number one, do dress for success. When you interview for a U.S. medical residency program, you should plan to dress in business formal attire. Your appearance affects the first impression you make on everyone you meet. So professionalism and modesty are key. Do make sure you directly address the interviewer's questions. Part of the interview is to determine how well you can communicate since effective communication is essential to your success in a residency program, not to mention your career as a physician in the future. So make sure you're just not just answering the questions you think the interviewer might ask, you really pay attention to what they are saying. Also, if you're not sure what the interviewer means when they ask you a question, don't be afraid to clarify. An interviewer will appreciate a clarifying question much more than a confused, rambling answer that fails to truly address the question. You do remember to smile. There's no doubt that an interview for a, a US medical residency program is nerve wracking and a high pressure experience. But you have to remember that your interviewers are trying to get to know you and not like trying to grab, trap you in a gotcha question or make you look silly. They actually want to get to know you. Do be polite to everyone you meet, no exception. That's very important and it's very professional of you. Do get any paperwork in on time. Residency involves a lot of paperwork from credentialing to immunization reviews to completing your charts, Programs may shy away from a resident who has to be emailed personally multiple times to fill out their paperwork or schedule their interview, as it is a red flag for requiring a lot of extra help in the future. Do take notes. It will give you something to remember about the program and also some ideas for questions to ask of the interviewers. Do have questions at the end of the interview. Most interviewers will ask if you have any questions. This is in part to help answer anything you may have 
but also it gives us a sense of how interested and prepared you are. Have a few questions about the program. They can be generic, such as what are some things you recently changed about the program, or are there any things you see changing about the program in the future? Or they can be specific about how the rotations are structured or how much time residents spend in the ICU, for example. So make a list of questions ahead of time that you want to ask about. Um, if you don't, it can lead to an awkward silence if the interviewee just has no questions. Do be honest. If you tell a program you're ranking them number one, you can only have one number one. So if you change your mind later, let the program know that. If you are ranked in a matchable range and do not match there, the program leadership will know that you were dishonest and that will reflect poorly on you. So be honest. Do you, have a, do you have a plan for after residency? So no one expects you to have your life all figured out yet, but at least have thought about your interest. Do you want to work in a rural setting? Do a fellowship in something? Work in a major academic center? Do research? No one will look back in the future and hold you to these answers, but at least it shows that you've thought through your interest. Do be excited about your activities and accomplishments. An interviewer will probably ask you about the research, teaching, or volunteer experience that you listed on your application. Be able to speak about them articulately and with excitement. Excitement is contagious and so is boredom. Talk about how much you enjoyed the research project and what you learned from it. Avoid saying things like, I was just a tech on that project to meet the research requirement for my school, or I learned I hated research. Always focus on the positive part of the experience. Now we're gonna talk about the don'ts. Don't cancel the day before. If you cancel an interview spot, then that is one spot wasted that could have been offered to one of the hundreds of other applicants who were turned down. It is a poor form and it reflects poorly on you and your school. So give as much notice as possible if you have to cancel. Don't be annoyed if the interviewer hasn't read your application or has forgotten parts of it, such as where you went to college. Many of the interviewers are coming in to interview on a day they would otherwise have had oh, off. They probably glanced at the applications the night before, but may not have read all of it. Some interviewers read your personal statements, others do not. So always be polite and respectful in your answer, even if the interviewer has read your application. They have also likely interviewed 19 other people that day, and the applications can start to run together just as programs start to all look alike to you. So again, just summary, don't be annoyed. Don't speak negatively about other programs. If asked about your experience rotating at another place or even at a, your home institution, just don't speak negatively about them. You can compare and contrast them, but bad mounting other residents or bad mounting other programs is a big red flag. Don't speak negatively about other specialties too. It is inappropriate to do so. And you never know if the interviewer's significant other or parent might be a doctor in that specialty. So if you had a challenging experience on a rotation with another specialty, try to reframe it about what you learned through the challenges instead. And just talk about the positive experience, basically. Don't be casual, even if your interviewer is a resident. They often have just as much say in the decision of where to rank you and how to score your interview as any of the faculty interviews. So stay professional. And then don't act unprofessional outside of the formal interview slots. So um, a lot of the interviews, they have like a schedule. Um, they have like a, uh, a pre formal interview dinner, and there's a lot of in, informal uh, settings. So the interview process varies though between programs and most programs include multiple um, events outside the interview process, like a tour of the hospital or a meal with the faculty and current residents. These settings are kind of less formal, but you should still remember that people in the program are paying attention to your behavior. You may not need to wear a business suit to a restaurant, but it's still important to look clean and neat. It's also best to avoid controversial topics of conversations like politics or religion, excessive complaining, and of course, any foul language. So be on your best behavior, basically. 17, don't spend your interviews reciting your CV or personal statements. 
the program has already reviewed your CV and personal statement, so your interviewers will be familiar with your background. The interview offers you the opportunity to build on these documents and show them why you truly belong in the program. While it's okay to talk about the goals and the accomplishment that you listed on your CV and discussed in your personal statement, make sure you're speaking candidly and expanding on your ideas and not just reciting the documents from memory because it's just going to sound boring to them because they know they already have the paper in front of them and they don't need to know that stuff. And that's about it. Thank you. And if you guys want any extra uh, resources, um, there's um, a, a blog, a residency interview tips, and there's the first aid for match, and there's also um, a match advice. It's a video. So you're welcome to take a look at those. Thank you very much. And does anyone have any questions? All right, if I don't see any questions, we're gonna go ahead with the uh, demonstration for the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for this great um, tips for interview. My name is um, Shaima. I'll be the interviewee, uh, interviewer for today. Um, Dr. Iman. Hello. Hello. Um, so, uh, how are you today, Dr. Iman? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for um, accepting our inter in invitation uh, for the interview. Of course, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. How is the weather at your end? Um, not too bad. It's getting a little cold here. Um, I am not a cold person, <laughs> but um, it tends to warm out by midday, which is great. Okay, so um, let's start about our um, interview by telling me about yourself. Yeah, of course. Um, so um, my name is Iman and I was born in Saudi Arabia, but my family is originally from Sudan. Um, I grew up in many different places and um, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I think it was uh, very difficult. And, um, you know, as a child, everything, the slightest thing seems like it's the end of the world. Um, so that's how I think I perceived it at the time, but I am much more appreciative today and tend to be nicer to my dad. Um, I relocated to the United States in 2017, um, came directly to Denver and really just been acclimating since then. Um, what brought you to, um, to, relocate or to relocate or to come to the USA? Um, my husband had gotten accepted into med school at Anschutz Medical Campus here. Um, he is originally an engineer that <laughs> somehow decided wanted to change careers. So that great. Also, yeah at the time meant all of us changing careers as well, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, it, um, and then you decided to uh, pursue the residency here. Yeah. Um, then why, why did you choose to um, pursue a pediatric residency? Oh, uh, that's a good one. Um, and a multifaceted one. I think as far back as I can remember, um, third year med school, I always gravitated towards pediatrics. And I think that is not particularly unique to me. I think many of us in peds can tell you a rewarding patient encounter that was like, okay, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. Um, I definitely have a lot of those, but I think what was most interesting for me was the not so great encounters, right? The tragic stories, the sad stories. Um, the cases where I ended up losing a patient. I think what was unique to peds for me compared to when I was practicing other disciplines, let's say in my internship or throughout my medical career, uh, my medical school was the tragic cases sort of stuck with me and just provided this internal drive to do better, to be better, you know, to add not only just treat, 
you know, children, but also advocate for them and, and build a better world for them because they deserve it. And honestly, I can't see myself doing anything else. And I, at no point in my life, did I do anything else? Um, so I think Pete's to me is both the good and the bad and the incredible uphill journey that we we still have to fight for the kids. Yeah, I agree. Doctors can be the best advocates for um, the patients. Okay. Um, why do you think I should pick you to join my team? Uh, um, I think I am quite a unique applicant. I think I bring a lot to the table from everything I have learned and just my di diverse upbringing, my diverse um, learning. And um, I think one definite strength was, is my diversity. And although, like I said earlier, I didn't appreciate it to, at the time, I think hindsight is twenty twenty, And I'm very much appreciative of who it has made me and who I've become. Um, I think that above all, I do have a thirst for learning and also do believe that it doesn't matter where you are in the career ladder at one point, at what point, there's always something new to learn from everyone around you, whether senior, junior, not even in the medical field. And I've noticed that that has served me well throughout my career and, and yeah. I think those are those are what I'm most proud of. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see yourself in the after five years from now? Um, well, ideally, um, I would be two years post my residency with your program. Um, but in terms of in terms of careers and where I plan, okay, to, I'm really sorry about that. In terms of my career and where, okay, <laughs> sorry guys, okay. Um, in terms of my career, I think I, I'm walking into residency with a very open attitude regarding what specialty I want to go to. I think currently I'm leaning towards cardiology, but I also am aware that that probably has everything to do with my position right now and the fact that I am working, currently working in cardiology. Um, so I don't have a, I don't have an exact idea of which specialty I'm going to be in. I think I'm more comfortable in telling you what I don't want to do as opposed to what I do want to do. Um, so I don't know, we'll see in terms of, in terms of um, fellowship and residency, but I do know that I definitely want to build on my career after residency. So I will be pursuing a fellowship. Um, what it actually is, TBD, we'll see. Um, and research, I think research is I have spent uh, the majority of my career really in research. Um, so that is one thing I'm, I'm fairly confident that I will be pursuing. What was your last research project? Um, I actually um, just got chosen to be um, a podium presenter in the PIXIS or Pediatric Intensive Care um, Cardiology Society International Annual Meeting. Um, I'll be presenting our latest breakthrough, which is novel biomarkers of a necrotizing pterocolitis in ch children undergoing congenital heart disease surgery. Um, so I definitely okay. have always been, sorry, I can't hear you. 
I said congratulations. That sounds great. Thank you. I am actually very excited. Um, we've been working on this project for, for a very long time. And, um, you know, when, when you start with one question and a hypothesis, and then as you go, it just starts branching out. And so it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's beautiful to finally see the results. Um, yeah. so it, just circling back to where I see myself in five years, I think research is definitely something that I will build upon and hopefully get to a point where I am able to write R01 grants on my own. Um, but we'll see, <laughs> you never know. Yes. Um, okay, uh, tell me about a failure in your life and how you uh, responded to it. Ooh. Okay, so another tough one. Okay, um, I, if you're okay with it, I'm gonna divide it into personal and professional. Mm -hmm. um, even though they're somewhat interlinked, I think um, on a professional level, um, the biggest one that I can tell you about is really associated with the same research that we just spoke about. Um, I think I was responsible for um, not only collecting, analyzing, and delivering some very precious samples, um, I also had to develop an algorithm of tracking them and tracking which samples were run um, and what results presented which patient. And I think what ended up happening was I miscalculated in one of my algorithms. So the end result was a picture that was not completely accurate or precise. Um, Thankfully, it, it was not an irreversible mistake. It just um, cost time. <laughs> and it, it can be very frustrating just cranking through the numbers and cranking through the data. And even more so if you have to reverse um, the same cranking that you went through. So I think the lesson I learned from that particular mistake was um, time Necessar it wasn't necessarily a lesson that I was not aware of, but I think it's something that definitely got reinforced. Time is precious. So whatever time you have, try to make sure that I'm double checking my work. And I think more importantly was always having an extra set of eyes to overlook what I am doing and just double checking and sort of like safety valves before moving on to the next step, I think that would have definitely saved myself and my team a lot of time. Um, we ended up making two trips um, to a city outside of where we are and working a weekend. And like I said, eventually it worked out great, but um, I did lose very precious time that I could have been doing something else with more productive. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal level, I think, I think this is one that is quite common in medicine. Um, just being able to, to delegate, I think, and, and realize our limits and, and being aware and very conscious of our own personal limits. And that is okay sometimes to just not be okay. Um, I think what I failed to do at some point was successfully delegate with my family or really know how to switch it off between work and home. There is time for work and there's time for home and realizing that that is really, truly very important for my mental health as well as the mental health of um, my friends, my family, um, both those with me here and by here I mean America and then also family back home. Um, again, it is a lesson that I had to learn the hard way, but hopefully doing better at it. Okay, so um, how do you spend your free time? Ooh, uh, so in terms of hobbies, um, I am a baker. <laughs> I think it's my way of de-stressing. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just, I love baking. What do you bake? Oh, what do I not bake is the question. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, my family probably wish that I cook more than I bake, but whatever, that's okay. We're just going to ignore that. Um, I also have I'm recently- a bake, baking too, so yeah. Ooh, do you, is there a particular thing you like baking? Um, I, I'm, I guess I'm um, just like you, but during COVID time, I started to bake a lot of bread and different types of bread. Wow. So, yeah. I've, I've always found bread one of the harder things to bake. We um, can share some tips later. Okay. I would appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I've recently really gotten into hiking as well. Um, I don't hike half as much as I want to, but it's, it's a good way to de-stress and just sort of shake off the days. Thankfully, um, Denver has a lot of trails. And I know one of the reasons I, I really was looking into your program was just the nature and the outdoor life that is very rich in your state. Mm -hmm. And then randomly, I, you will find me just pouring over interior design things, which is completely unrelated to medicine, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, Dr. Iman, it was a pleasure talking to you. To wrap up this interview, um, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I think um, COVID sort of really highlighted um, the importance of mental health for us and just in medicine specifically. So I was wondering what your program really does for the, to ensure the mental well-being of its residents. Um, okay, I'm sure the program director will have answers for that. Um, do you have other question? <laughs> um, that's about it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Okay, that's the end of the session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any questions for, uh, or um, feedback, feedback for Iman and Shema? Doctor, now that I'm very much interested in your feedback, <laughs> I saw the smile. Yeah, I think uh, you did great, uh, excellent, uh, excellent work uh, for both of you, the questions and the answers. And uh, I know uh, you have family, and uh, you're gonna be uh, spending your time uh, accordingly when doing the actual interview. Uh, maybe you can give you feedback as uh, and different when you have the camera. And, uh, but from the voice, I can say uh, that you were smiling, you were telling the answers uh, the way that it should be. Uh, I didn't notice any nervousness or um, sometimes I that you might be able to uh, be under stress. Uh, so I didn't see or hear that from the Answers your voice, uh, create some confidence that I like. Uh, you did humor for these are great things in your answers, and uh, I think you were honest when, when you answered all the questions. Uh, I don't have any immediate feedback, so the only thing I want is just to practice and. Uh, and when you are on camera, you will have additional uh, tools like using your hands, expression, your voice, your face, your smiles, all this uh, contribute uh, as important as your answers as well. So the background, the present lighting. Good luck. I was, yeah, about the camera, I was waiting on, I was like, okay, if they ask me, I will turn it on. <laughs> yeah.
I, I, I know some people might be with families and kids and it's interruption, yeah. so that's that's all right. But, okay. Uh, awesome. yeah. Thank you. Any other feedback from? Uh, yes, go ahead. Go on. Hi, uh, I think it was very good. Honestly, you were very genuine, just being yourself. I like that a lot. Um, one thing I want to say is when she was when she asked you to tell her about yourself, uh, you spoke about the background, but you didn't speak about the situation right now. So I don't think everyone got what what are you currently doing. So if you could just start by what, what are you doing right now? You're a research fellow, for example, you're working in cardiology and then uh, talk about your background. Uh, I think that would be better, but that was a great job. I liked awesome. it. Thank you, Dara. Yeah, that completely slipped my mind. Thanks. <laughs> That's a good one. I think you can add also, uh... Some of the qualities, and uh, this is uh, like if you want to add more keywords or highlight areas, then you can add to what you are doing. Also, I you can say I'm a good multitasking, I'm a good team and members. Uh, I work with students in this thesis, and I work as a leader for this thesis. Uh, whatever project you contribute, you can mention I contribute this project, or I'm working on this project. So as I think one of the, the answers uh, you used, uh, uh, explain that you will be presenting as a foreign visitor uh, and research. So they gave you a follow-up question about, tell me more about that. So yeah. sometimes you use some words so that the, the viewer can, you can lead the conversation. To, okay. yeah, the conversation. Where you feel comfortable, you want to add more information to the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Dr. Nader, yes. I have a yes. question. Yes. Um, I know that the, the core, the, the interviewer always um, focus on the core competences in their um, interview. How we can reflect these like these core competences in our answers, like how we can sound more professional. I know, like dress up and the body language, but um, if you can give us some tips on reflecting the core competences in our answers, it would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, what other core competences do uh, you think about when when talking about? Like the the. Uh, patient care, for example, because they don't even like like it's not often to ask about um, a case presentation, like um, an interesting case or so. So this most likely it will be uh, elicited or they can observe it when you are talking about your experiences, like. Uh, Iman mentioned that she uh, loved doing this case uh, exam and treating them, but at the same time, she also affected or she didn't talk, she satisfied when she insists in patients or property uh, them. So, doing that or explaining things from a personal level or how that affects you, I think that also can as well can be so sometimes I use uh, sentences where it may sound and match the one who listens to me. And I go to nursing homes and one of the models of the uh, nursing homes is say, we are family. So when I see my patient, and if there is a family member there, I try to always mention that we will treat you as family. So we all be in one team. So you will be my boss for today, something like that. I will mm -hmm. let the patient be uh, at comfortable level, but I will also deliver the message to the patient's family members that we all in a team, all in the same board. And, uh, we 
treat their loved one as one of uh, him, for example, if if I'm just uh, sending you the message. Uh, so when when you're talking, you know, answers. If you give this elaboration uh, similar to when you treat the patients, uh, it will come across, and then they will say, "Oh yeah, you yeah, you yeah, yeah, take care of yeah. the patient." The other uh, part of the component uh, of the component is the system and the culture and the, like let's say the EMR, for example. So if you have exposure to some of the EMR uh, mm -hmm. systems, if you mention that either in your publication in your personal statement or you your interview. So if you say, I work with so and so in Capitalist recovery in months and stories, and we work with Epic, uh, mm -hmm. it's a good system, something like that. Or I have exposure to multiple EMR. I use Epic, I use Serna, I use this. And I am comfortable using an EMR. So by saying that or injecting that somewhere in the answer, then they will say, oh, yeah, uh, you have not some knowledge on the system where you will be going through. Uh, everyone will have some training in the EMR that they start. They will have some hours to, to do the EMR. Okay. Uh, one thing you can mention also the culture. So in in Man's uh, answer, she mentioned that she troubled. And so when she what she told the uh, that I will put something into the table. I will bring uh, my uh, diversity or uh, background experiences, and at the same time I spent. A couple of years here in the US, and I know some of the cultures here, so I'm kind of adapted to the culture and I know something. So, by this saying uh, this word, you will let them know that you have at least some uh, openness or some experience when they uh, hire you, you will treat the patients all the same uh, culture they have or differences they have. Okay. Okay, so now that's that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Any other questions regarding this uh, interview or any of the presentation? All of you did great, uh, actually. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the interview and the tips and the feedback. Go ahead. Hey guys, so um, I was wondering about um, the question when they ask about um, clinical interesting cases. Uh, do we have to go into details uh, about um, a case or a scenario? Um, I'm not sure if it's one of the questions asked regularly asked by program directors. My advice to you is to uh, have a case uh, prepared. And if you can remember that case, actual case, it would be very helpful if you can uh, share that when you are doing a uh, mock interview with someone. And try to see how you can present that in a meaningful way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, some, some, some programs may ask this, uh, but not all. Uh, some programs may ask uh, other to take a knowledge kind of situation where they want you to react uh, to their questions. They want to see how uh, you can um, anticipate, or not anticipate, but answer and anticipate the questions. So most of the questions will be, Tell us about yourself, what you test, what it is, like maybe a case, maybe. But in this, in this interview, they may ask you a question where you will be off guard. It's not on your list of questions that you practice. So make sure you prepare to handle that um, well. So I'm going to share with you uh, this 
here. So we added some uh, videos. It's on YouTube that I added here as for the sake of collection of uh, data uh, for you guys to feel I'm using the app. But one of the interviews uh, done by uh, Dr. Uh, Stroa, I think. Uh, she was here in Michigan. I'm not sure if she's still here or uh, she joined the program and she became a program director. And uh, I think she also was the, the program director for a fellowship in the graphic. But that program, for some reason, uh, did not. So I'm not sure what the details I'm trying to reach and to look at that this time. But she mentioned some of her interview stories and she also gave it, uh, gives some tips uh, for the day of the interview. Uh, so she had an incident where she was with the um, program there. So if you listen to her stories and her tips, that might be also helpful for you guys. There are a couple of videos where the program directors from uh, different um, programs they have some tips and what they look for, what uh, you can do to the So if you have uh, time to look at this, uh, watch these videos, maybe you will have some uh, tips uh, similar to what uh, was mentioned earlier. Thank you. No more questions, so we can uh, go to the next uh, part where we will ask you guys about that. If anyone has any uh, project or uh, course or any idea, please share with us uh, if you have any updates. Hello, Dr. Nadir. Hello, Dr. Nadir. Hello. I'm not how are you? How, how is everyone going? Yes. So, uh, I wanted to share with you what I did so far with uh, the INR app. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let us share my screen, please. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. So this is the INR app I, I created. I called it the INR guard. This is the first screen that is going to appear for the user, which is in this case, uh, my patient. So I added a description for the app. The INR guard app was created to help you take your blood thinner as prescribed and to learn more about INR monitoring. And here, the patient, first of all, is going to enter. Let's sign out to show you. So this is the first screen that is going to appear. And then the user is going to enter his email. I'm going to enter my email in this case. And then press the continue button. Sorry, but I have some problem with my tablet. I'm sorry for the delay. No worries. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So I'm going to enter my email address. We lost the voice.
Canvas. So when uh, YG is trying to uh, check, get the, the message. So there, there are some uh, fellows in this uh, group, uh, this fellowship, they are working on building a new app. And so it could be a uh, person or could be in a group a team, right? So we want to build something for the patients. And uh, so I'm a little bit more ready to can just jump in. Get your screen. So uh, this uh, group of fellows, uh, we asked them to build uh, something from scratch, we have some examples uh, that can be used. Uh, I think one for the uh, attention uh, monitoring of pressure and uh, pulse rate of them and uh, their heart rate and so forth. Uh, we can build similar ones. Uh, there are a lot of uh, blood sugar ads that uh, you can be used. It's just the way we can help our patients. Uh, if you want to build something like that, it's not a difficult task, it's just step by step. And it might be helpful when you talk about uh, this project uh, during the interview process. Are you with us or we lost you? In the meantime, anyone else wants to share their information or updates the products? I hope everyone is involved at least in one product so far. If no questions or I know uh, the project is going to uh, present a top team and three days and we may want to conference and uh, in November we can go to a different conference also. As you mentioned, this team will be working on the work that for that. Any new ideas or new uh, products? So for the next uh, meeting, this uh, this team will present. So we we'll talk about the. Uh, Agenda topic. I hope that uh, at least in the group, at least one of you or maybe a couple can pick up a topic and maybe you can talk about some of these topics. Uh, if there is anyone who wants to practice uh, for the next uh, mock interview, we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. So for the Zoom meeting, if you have any other uh, suggestions, any other um, comments, please uh, let me know. I wish you all the best. Uh, I'm going to stay longer. Uh, if anyone else wants to stay, that's fine. If, uh, we have other applications to so go. I wish you all the best. Have a good night. Have a good day. And uh, we will see you next week. If anyone else is working on the IMR uh, project or uh, app development, anyone wants to share their progress so far?
and also a few dope the faces at this first one of the two. I'm kind of sure to do until uh, the night comes. Uh, but uh, we are developing uh, uh, here in Latin uh, and here. So uh, we were uh, going to build some uh, penthouse team kind of app and um, my idea is to develop something that I will help the patient work with games and so forth, but also to track how they are doing and so forth. So this is the first uh, stage for the app. And then this is just a better version so for someone who is going to try it. We want to give them an option to report the bug, and each page has a page number with a reference. So when they say, Oh, this is not working, at least I know what page they were talking about. When they go to the next page, it has some like editor, they can pick up the result, whatever they want to. Next, and then uh, this is the profile uh, building, so it's kind of two or three pages. And then they go to the working okay, page, and uh, you can skip what we are going to do, or we can go ahead. Okay. So these are just basic questions like uh, that, uh, state examination or orientation kind of. And uh, so we'll ask them what's the day today of the week. They can say yes, Saturday. For the next question, what the month of uh, October? I can read it. This is a year. Then they can say, oh, where do you live? Where do you stay now? Um, or this question about things of the choice. Uh, what the uh, state? So they can select what the state is historical month. Then we will ask them to identify what's going on in the future. For example, this picture, what this girl is doing. Um, so, you know, walking, sleeping, and listening to the music. So, fix this spot here, listen to the music, for example. And then we go to the find uh, and tell us how they can. Uh, from this uh, plot there, and the date can be put it up and put it in the calendar for March. So they can say, Oh, yeah, it's uh, today, today is uh, what's the date today? April 14th, uh, October, uh, October, 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 and what's this time? And it's four o'clock, seven o'clock, so yeah, four, five. Uh, so the data will be here, and we can convert it. We can convert that into different uh, data files. So this whole map is going to come out of the map of the plot. We want them to remember things. We can ask about these uh, three items, and then some uh, calculation problem. Uh, they can do that, and then we want them to identify these uh, three items. So. If they can remember, you can put them down, type them down. So either they will type them, they can go there to the stairs and then go. So in the back uh, ground, we will replace these places with commas, for example, and then we will identify. If they check the title, we have to check the bar, we have to check. With the graph, yes, and we can also. So, 
So it will be uh, selected and the time to the music and so forth. It will be locked uh, in the block book or something like that. This is, uh, for instance, uh, our music. Or they can take uh, exercise. So, I'm a person on Sapa in the or not in the chat. How to prevent dementia or by taking a walk or exercise. So, we'll ask them what kind of uh, exercise do you like, and uh, if you are using any specific device or their own, or I don't use anything. So, we'll go to next, and then we want to block a little bit. Activities. So they walk for 15 minutes mm -hmm. and added to the so if we think of the so day, we walk for 15 minutes, that's a day 15 minutes of total, and the last two days is 30 minutes. So you are doing a good job, something like that. And it goes for if they want to do uh, civility or soft work, uh, work five minutes, uh, if they want to learn a new language or if they want to like uh, in human general baking, if she wants to get more about other issues or something like that, she can find out there. Yeah. Uh, 
I think we asked about uh, prayers or meditation or something like that. So that we can do a meditate how long can we uh, spend uh, so other friends to let them come up with this walking lesson and to say, oh, today I meditated uh, five minutes or ten minutes or whatever they can mention that. So it could be somewhere where last part is sleep, so we won't Basically, this is uh, the whole activity or part of the act that we want to get from the patient. And they can repeat this uh, every day or the other day, whatever time. And we will uh, take how they do. If they have suggestions, they can go and do that if they want to know how to do stuff. Uh, hello, Dr. Nadir. Hello, Amali. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sorry. I, I lost my connection accidentally. I don't know what happened. Okay. So back. if there is enough time, I can share it again if you would. Yes, please. Okay. We were just waiting for you. So. Okay. So I'm going to enter my app again. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. We lost your voice now. <laughs> Are you muted? We lost you again. <laughs> so far, we can tell uh, this is a great job uh, as far as uh, the text page and volume page and profile page. In the meantime, maybe we can have a topic. Can you uh, update us uh, about your profession for the next meeting? The conference, the poster. While I'm getting back to us, she got disconnected. It seems. Mr. Abir, are you with us? Uh, sorry, Dr. Nader, I didn't hear you. Uh, can you just give us an update? How is your preparation for the conference? Uh, I think you are going to present soon, right? Next yeah. In a few days. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to start at 8 a.m. at uh, October 22nd, 20 to 22nd. So I invite all of uh, AMA members to log in at that time and just vote for our call. Abstract. Hopefully, we can enter the semi final or maybe final. I don't know. Fine. We'll pray so for do us. You have the link, or you can share, you can share the link with the fellows so that they can 
uh, okay follow. okay i will yes i will yeah. share the link and the whatsapp group okay. that sound good yeah. okay Bye. thank you thank you very much Uh, I actually apologize for everyone. I have a problem with my tablet and I think I'm going to fix it by next meeting. So whenever I share, uh, it logs out can, of the can, Zoom. Can, can, I don't can you know. Share, uh, can you share the link uh, for the app? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Okay, of course. Okay. So you put your email, it will send you a pin number. So you put a pin number and you can log in. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I got to your profile, not my profile. But Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you. So I can control the screen now. So let's see. I think I think I'm not controlling because I'm not sure. I'm clicking on the go button, but nothing happened. So I I, I will do what you want me to do. So click on the go button and you know, I do that. So go ahead. Yes. And then, so I created uh, multiple drop lists. The first one says the target INR, so the patient can choose. And the second one is uh, about the last result. So if it is within the target range, a medication dose. So I added the most common doses of warfarin. Then I added some instructions. If the patient uh, complaining of any red or pink urine, uh, change in the color of feces or coughing up blood, uh, all indicating bleeding as complication of warfarin, then the patient is going to click yes. So then uh, takes him to a screen where he can call or message the doctor. I added my number here. Mm -hmm. sure. So um, yes, it's going to take uh, the patient to the um, call screen of his, his phone mm -hmm. and then call ambulance in case the bleeding is so severe. And uh, while the patient is awaiting for medical help, there are some measures he can do in case of nosebleed or a bleeding cut wound. So you can scroll down, Dr. Nadir, so they can see the rest of the screen. Yes, thank you. So some instruction just in case uh, medical help is going to be late. And then uh, at the bottom of the screen, there is the about INR. Yes, I added the most common questions asked by the patient, what is INR and blood thinner medications, and I describe it in um, a very simple way the patient can understand. So I added about uh, six questions, I think, or five. Yes, and then at the bottom of the screen, there is the educational video part. So those are videos from YouTube, educational videos about the interactions of warfarin and uh, how it works. And then the calendar, the last one at the bottom of the screen, yes. And the patient here can set up the next dose appointment, the next dose um, time and the next appointment. And also um, just a reminder uh, to remember to take the medication at the same time every day. So this is the app. And uh, I would really love to hear your comments and if there is anything that I can add or delete.
Thank you so much, Dr. Nadir, for this opportunity. I had so much fun creating the app, actually. Excellent. Uh, thank you. This is great. Uh, this is awesome. Uh, um, I think we'll hear from the group if there is any feedback. And we'll come across some questions. This is excellent, excellent work. Good job. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadir. You work on it by yourself or with my team? With some team members. Did you work alone? Yes, Dr. Nadir. I have did some you, problems with my did, internet. Did you work Sorry. on this by yourself alone? Or? Uh, yes, yes, by myself. Great, 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 great job. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadir. And thank yeah. you for the opportunity. This is the first time I work on Glide. Oh, look at that. And uh, fair shot, you already have a program that actually we can sell and uh, we can divide the decision. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. Yeah. Great job. Excellent job. So if anyone has any question or any difficulty, I'm very glad to help anyone with their application. Hello, Dr. Nader. Hello. Uh, hi. Hello, Dr. Amal. I have one question. Uh, like, can we add one information also in this application, like uh, what for interaction with P450 inducer and enhancer for the patient knowledge? You know, now uh, how the drugs are interact with this warfarin. Uh, so, what do you think about it? So I added uh, simple information like there are uh, some medications and diets uh, that can interact with warfarin, but I did not go into details of enzyme inhibitors and enzyme inducers because I thought this is going to be just complicated for the patient to understand. And this app is not for uh, medical use. It's for, for patients on warfarin just to help them uh, stick to their medication and just learn more. So... Uh, I don't know, but uh, I thought this would be another level, like like for doctors, not for patients. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Good work. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, follow up on Avinash. I think uh, you can add some. So you mentioned about the alcohol. I think you can add one more about antibiotics because some, if they prescribe some antibiotics, they will. That's a good idea, yeah. Dr. Nader. I will do that. Excellent. Any other comments? Thank you, Avinash. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. This is great. Good job. So Thank you, everyone. Has questions and uh, Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. And reach out to me if there is any question. I have a question, still a question. Is it Amal or is it Amal? <laughs> uh, no, it's Amal. <laughs> yeah. Hope, hope. <laughs> yes, hope. <laughs> we must hope as well. We can just ask and uh, some of the apps. Oh, that's great. Great. So from what uh, she shared with you guys, I think it's doable. And the sky is the limit, so you can uh, modify, you can uh, build, and you can uh, think about how people will use it, and even yourself, maybe you can say how you can use it. Uh, so, sorry, yes, Dr. Nader, just uh, I wanted uh, to do, add one more thing. I actually started creating this app one month ago, it's not recent. But then I gave up because I found it very difficult and I told myself just better to focus on other things. But uh, then uh, about two days ago, I decided to just I want to do this to challenge myself. And 
I wanted to learn about it. And uh, I remember watching many YouTube videos on how to use all these buttons and uh, how to add uh, a call. Like, for example, when I wanted to add the, the, my number and the phone call, this was a very difficult step. So I spent maybe an entire day just to make this one, but it's doable. So once you understand it, it's very fun and it makes you want to make uh, more, more applications. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Uh, initially, you might have some challenges here and there. Your idea uh, might not come across the way you want it. Uh, but the good news is uh, many people come across the same more or less uh, ideas. Uh, and someone solved the problem of the challenge for you. So if you look around, you will find a solution. Actually, they have a community where people can ask questions and you can share the experience and how to think and how to overcome some of the challenges. But uh, I think it's, it's doable. And thank you for trying. And you did a great job. Good effort and good product. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. If no one else uh, has any comments or questions, uh, we'll uh, end the meeting today. Uh, but I'd like to thank all of you uh, who are present today and who will come and look at this uh, recording, but for the presenters and uh, Dr. Salma, thank you so much um, for a great uh, job, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and night with your family else. Thank you, Dr. Nader and everyone else. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you. 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 Thank you.